Thank you for staying with us on the U45 Morning Show. Um, we now have our guest in house, Dr. Peter Ujomu. Welcome to our program. Good Welcome, morning, sir. He is the Executive Director of Health Matters Incorporated. Um, uh, it's good to have you here. Let, let's begin by having some insight. What do you do at Health Matters uh, Incorporated? We've Thank you very much. Yes. Good morning, uh, viewers. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Ujomo, and um, I'm the Executive Director of Health Matters Incorporated. Health Matters Incorporated is a public health uh, institution uh, started f far back in 1995, and uh, we were incorporated under the Companies and Allied Matters uh, decree, as it were then. That is, it was then known, the and we have been operating um, as a civil society organization, um, variously defined, maybe like an NGO. Okay. So along the line, we have been able to um, work uh, to first, during the era of HIV and AIDS, when things were really very difficult and people were living in fear, we were able to bring in our expertise in the area of epidemiology, in the area of public health dissemination and uh, behavior change. So we, we did a lot of um, advocacies at those levels. And um, over since then, um, I'm talking about um, 25 years on, we have had an unbroken period of um, working within Lagos, Southwest states, South South states, and we have been able to impact on our communities uh, to a large extent. That's um, interesting. We have also been working in the area of malaria. You know, as you know, um, we live in a malaria endemic, you know, region, and through the support of um, some organizations such as the Global Fund. Uh, uh, Christian Relief Services, um, Society for Family Health, we've been able to uh, expand the education around uh, what is malaria. You know, there had been so many information that we had growing up. The myths around malaria, for instance, that you can get malaria by walking in the sun, you can get malaria by eating palm oil and stuff like that. So we have had to reorientate people and get people to understand what causes malaria. You know, those are the uh, things that we have had to make sure people focus their attention. How to use the LLI, and that's the long-lasting insecticidal treated nets. How to use it appropriately. How to also ensure that the test, you know, for malaria using what we call the RDT, you know, rapid uh, diagnostic uh, tests to ensure that we have um, you know, malaria parasite in the bloodstream rather than taking anti-malaria just as we feel. Um, some of those things have been known to damage um, the internal uh, organs of the body when they are consumed um, you know, haphazardly. So we have always encouraged that people do all those tests before they begin to take malaria drug and that when they start taking it, they have to complete the course. Because as you know, most of us, once we take the first, second dose, uh, we feel good and then we abandon it. That's especially the use of um, ACT. You know, uh, it, ACT is the artesanate, you know, uh, combination yeah. therapy, which is the current um, drug in the, you know, as first line of treatment okay, that you is recommended. That you were, you've been, you know, say educating some people in life. Who, who exactly were you dealing with now? Do you go to schools or where, where do you carry out this? Uh, oh, we deal with the general population. Um, you know, in the course of our work, oftentimes you have to focus on specific population at mm -hmm. a time. Um, so we have to deal, our organization, you know, work with poorly educated or people in hard to reach communities. So you uh, go to their communities? Yes, we go to communities. Okay. Um, we go to communities and some of these communities are not difficult to get, but they are difficult to enter by some standards, especially mm -hmm. when you look at it from an elitist point of view. Yes. Um, some people don't feel very comfortable walking into communities such as Makoko, for instance, such mm -hmm. as um, you know, Elaje, for instance. These are very you know, um, difficult to walk areas, but the um, majority of our population live there. Yeah. So, so we, we have a responsibility to actually extend our services mm -hmm. to those people. And currently, we're working in the area of diabetes, and uh, we, we testing for diabetes, and also uh, referring. We started by doing a lot of teaching, 
you know, about what diabetes is, working with the Ministry of Health here in Lagos State, the, the, the World Diabetes Foundation, which is based in Denmark, Copenhagen, you know, supporting uh, our activities to make sure that our people get to know the predisposing factors for diabetes and how to, um, you know, manage it, as it were. Uh, and as you can see, with the current pandemic, there is, you know, a lot of um, concern that people who, are, who have their comorbidities, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, and, you know, heart diseases and so on, they are more at risk of COVID-19. So um, our work is to ensure that those who have had some, um, you know, concerns about this, you know, areas of health, you know, take it more seriously. So we are, we are doing a lot of testing. We are doing a lot of referrals. Uh, we don't do treatment. Mm -hmm. we, we refer them to appropriate um, facilities that we have linkages with, okay. principally the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, the Lagos State University um, Teaching Hospital. And uh, of course, there are many other facilities that have capacity to manage this. But right now, we're working with 35 primary health care centers across the state where we, you know, we've been able to give them equipment, we've been able to provide them with um, testing facilities, we've been able to provide them with appropriate, um, you know, instruments to make sure that you know, people who come in for routine tests are properly checked. And also when there are predisposing um, issues, they can be managed effectively and it's records are kept. Yes, on diabetes, mm -hmm. and that's going on right now. We hear it has a lot to us, some, to the legislature, something to do with food, what you eat. But what would be your advice to those who have diabetes in terms of diet? In terms of diet, for someone who has been confirmed to have diabetes, yes. he, you know, there are some uh, counseling um, issues that we bring in, such as ensuring that, you know, you eat more of uh, foods that are less in carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. You know, and also you eat more of balanced meals, mm. um, making sure you exercise. And for those who have alcohol as part of um, what they do, mm. uh, please stop alcoholic uh, beverages, okay. stop um, smoking. Mm. These things have a tendency to increase, you know, the susceptibility of individuals to diabetes. Mm. And when they are poorly managed, of course, um, the dangers are very clear because hypertension is, you know, a major concern right now. And um, if you have observed in the couple of months that we have seen, a lot of people have, um, you know, died rather mysteriously. And that's why we call hypertension a silent killer because most times it doesn't give enough notice. Yeah. You know, um, once we were doing an activity at the Lagos um, mainland, um, teaching Lagos mainland uh, uh, local government and somebody just um, collapsed mm -hmm. and um, the, the market women, you know, who were the uh, major act, you know, actors in that program, many of them ran away, mm -hmm. you know, but we know what the problem was well, and uh, this person had been living with high blood pressure and has not been taken care of it. So, you know, just making sure that this person is properly managed. So we had to take the person to the hospital and then they, they were able to manage the, the, the high blood pressure. And of course, um, from there, the test was conducted and she was found to have, uh, you know, diabetes. And of course, confirmatory tests had to be done after that. So um, along the area of diabetes, we have been working with 35 primary health care centers here in Lagos State uh, with, the, with the active involvement of the primary health care board and of course the, the Ministry of Health here in Lagos State. And they, they have given us um, adequate support you know, to be able to do this and they are still continuing alongside some of the things we were able to you know, um, give in to strengthen those facilities. And this activity is ongoing right now. Um, let me okay. go ahead, go ahead. let me also dwell on um, you know an area which I think is of um, concern for especially the young people. Um, we we have an activity that we we are working with uh, an organisation called Rise Up. Rise Up is interested in ensuring that um, youth friendly services are incorporated into primary healthcare centres. You know, now the, re the, the issue is that many young people are shying away from going to 
primary health care centers for any kind of assistance mm -hmm. in their health area, principally because adults think that any young person that walks into a facility is there for either abortion mm -hmm. or is there for you know, um, you know, issues concerning reproductive health. Mm -hmm. And we have found out that this is a limiting factor to many people getting access to quality health care. So we are working with the Lagos State Government through the Primary Health Care Board to see that you know, two facilities, namely at Jeremy Feludu uh, and um, at Papa, you know, are you know, equipped in such a manner that young people who are around those areas will be able to access the primary health care centers anonymously without anybody judging them, without stigma associated with um, you know, issues around reproductive yeah. health for young people. So currently, the government has given us the go-ahead. We are working on this, and we are hoping that this will become you know, a part of the system for ensuring that every young person can walk into a primary health care center knowing that, one, there will be an, you know, a trained counselor you know, to attend to him or her. Two, knowing that the facility there has things that can conveniently you know, um, appeal to him or her in terms of um, what are those things young people want to see in a place that will attract them. So things like uh, you know, table tennis uh, board, you know, are introduced, will be introduced in some of those places. In actual fact, we have had this kind of youth centers over the years, one in Olaleye, one in Makuku, where we were able to draw, you know, a vast majority of these young people together, give them training, and enable them to begin to fend for themselves. But this one we are doing in Lagos State right now, with the active involvement of the state government, is to ensure that this, being a pilot, can then become a, you know, a precursor to a system where the entire state will begin to have you know, pockets of this kind of activity so that young people can always walk in you know, to some of these facilities, get adequate counsel, get adequate information, material, education, communication, and also be able to um, avail themselves of a trained counselor mm -hmm. who will be you know, relating with them, you know, in a manner that is not judgmental, in a manner that is not stigmatizing. And is this free for the young ones? Sure, it is free. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes. Okay, we, we, we'll take a break here. We have a message from Three Crowns Milk. We'll be back in a moment. Don't go away. Three Crowns Low in Cholesterol Milk is known to help take care of mom so she in turn can take care of her family. It's mine. I'm happy to like this, Bella. Dad, what's his period? Um, you see? Um, the Bella, is... dear, a period is used to end a sentence. Three Crowns Mill. Healthy moms, happy families. Welcome back. You know, today we are talking health on the U45 Morning Show, and we have our guest here, Dr. Peter Mjomo, Executive Director of Health Matters Incorporated. He's been telling us what his organization has been doing to promote health in our community. And um, we're, we're back to him. Uh, he's told us what he's been doing about uh, diabetes and other issues have, have to help the youth and the young ones. And the services are free. That's encouraging. Um, you wanted to ask yes, me a question. Uh, what's your experience about uh, the Makoko community in your preventive uh, healthcare uh, agenda? Yeah. What has been your experience? Um, over the years, um, let me just say we are the first NGO to get into Makoko, and this was in 1998. Um, the first activity we did with the Ford Foundation uh, assistance, we we experienced a mixed grill of um, good, bad, and ugly uh, in terms of um, the expectations of the people. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that this has been a blighted community for a very long time. You know, um, government assistance has, has been very, very uh, poor or non-existent. 
So our effort was seen at that point as if we had come to solve all their problems. Mm -hmm. But of course, um, you know, we could just do what we wanted to do. And the focus was to ensure that people's standard of living improved. And we believe and still believe that if people, if people's standard of living in terms of their knowing their health conditions was improved, of course, their economic well-being will be enhanced. And this was our approach. So with time, we introduced a youth center and um, this youth center, we funded it and encouraged the parents to support the children as they came in to do whatever. We had tailoring, we had um, catering, uh, we, we had um, you know, a nurse providing you know, training um, in reproductive health. And also they were availing themselves of the presence of the nurse for routine health issues. So our experience showed that there was a lot of gap, unmet needs in the lives of these people. And um, we did all we could to ensure that you know, uh, we were able to improve on this. And I think over the years, many other international and local NGOs have been able to go in there mm. and be able to you know, um, contribute their own quota. So I can say conveniently that our effort opened the way you know, um, for a lot of things to come. And over the years, we have also seen the World Bank coming there to, you know, do the only major road that links that road to, um, to a wire. So um, our effort had, and most of the young people that we, we worked with then, many of them have become graduates. Many of them have become very responsible today because of that opportunity that they were given. So they do not, some of them do not see Marco Ko as it used to be. Um, so it has become like a transit point for emerging young people. Mm -hmm. And once they get out of that place, they can see the other side of life and they have been able to move on. Mm -hmm. So I want to believe that we have done tremendously well. Um, and of course, there are rooms for improvement. Um, government can always come in because most of the needs of those people, they are they are huge in terms of financial um, commitment mm -hmm. that any one person can give. Yeah, you know, interestingly, Makoko has been featured in many international um, media. You know, there was a time, you know, people were asking us about the floating uh, school, school yeah. that was existing, and of course, it's no longer there. But we had a facility, we had a health facility that was existing for a very long time, and of course, today there is, a, you know, another one around the Ashejiri market, which um, you know is also serving the people. And I think overall, um, the people are the better off for it. And uh, we can only just appeal to government instead of um, you know, doing away with the entire community because there have been so many uh, forth and back yes. discussions mm -hmm. about relocating the community, yeah. about mm -hmm. you know, moving them away. They can go in there and see how they can improve the quality of life of the people. And it's not just about Makuku. There are so many other communities around Lagos that need this kind of assistance. We have worked in various of, you know, parts of Lagos and we can see that you know, um, a large percentage of our population reside in many of these hard to reach communities. And um, they, they, you know, they contribute their own quota to the development of this country. You'll be surprised that the, uh, the per capita income from some of these people you know, may be small, but it, does, it goes a long way. Well, well. You know, and we, we saw what these things could mean in terms of um, you know, uh, the poverty level, especially when we had the lockdown. Many of these people were in dire straits because they didn't have the daily incomes that they normally get maybe when they go into the sea and they, they fetch, you know, they get some fish. Mm. We used to provide the women with um, fishing stoves, yeah. mm. uh, fishing, um, drying stoves where they could dry their fish. When the men bring the fish, they dry the fish and then they, they bend it, they go out to sell. But many of them couldn't do that. And, you know, these were some of the major issues you know, so we have had um, to train some of those women, especially the Egun, the women from the Egun speaking part of um, the community, to be able to um, improve on the quality of you know, what they get from uh, fishing and drying and then selling. Okay. We, we, we've talk, we talked of uh, general health uh, situation of facilities before you came in. Um, from your experience, do you think the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, taught us some lessons that will 
make government to improve our health facilities in terms of equipment, in terms of manpower and skill? Fantastic question. I, I think, yes. Um, but the, the question is, have we learned? Yes. Um, the government has definitely done what they could at the point where this whole pandemic started. They started very well. When they locked down the airport, even though it, you know, some of us um, you know, feel that they, they delayed a little bit in locking down the airport. Mm. You know. However, subsequently we saw some flashes of um, you know, good practices. Yeah. You know. The lockdown was um, effective, and I think that was the point where the government needed to do a little bit more in terms of ensuring that people people's livelihoods were you know maintained in terms of giving people some palliatives you know some of the palliatives we had were being given um, I only personally I only had them on the news mm -hmm. and um, we've been told by the honorable minister in charge of humanitarian affairs mm -hmm. that some mil bil millions of naira yes. palliatives mm -hmm. uh, I can say with all you know confidence that this was not to the knowledge of many people. Yes. And I think this is an area that the government has failed. Okay. Once that happened, the, the, the pandemic was, you know, I mean, the, the effort to contain it mm. was missed by my estimation because I think that was an opportunity that we failed because people became, people became aggressive, people, people were hungry, and mm. people were saying, no, they want to go out and fend for themselves. You know, we were copying European systems that allowed people to, to stay home, and they were fed. Okay. Unfortunately, we didn't have the capacity. And so um, people were agitating to, to be let mm. alone and cope with the disease. And I think, you know, um, with what has happened now, we yeah. have all learned. And let me just say, that all the monies that have been earmarked for this, we need to make sure that they are well utilized. Okay. So many international agencies have come Coming to aid to us, aid. and all loopholes that ensure that people are either stealing or there are leakages or there are misappropriation or misapplication that we, we nip them in the board. And we use this opportunity to strengthen our health care system. system. We There's what so. we call health system strengthening. I think you've got to come back some other time yes, because uh, sure. we wanted to discuss a lot uh, with you on health matters because we've run out of time now. Um, uh, briefly, if you can uh, throw some light on I know I, ha I have a friend who is diabetic and at the stage he was uh, f f eating uh, this wheat. And at the stage again, he stopped. And when I said why, he said he was informed that it's counterproductive. To, because of the situation. Is there any truth to that? Well, um, generally what we tell people who have diabetes, mm. it's not as if you will stop eating all that you have been eating all together. Yes. But there is this understanding that you can now begin to eat in measured quantity. Mm -hmm. Now, nutritionists recommend that you, you know, a particular serving that is appropriate. So if you're eating a bar, for instance, there is a measure of it mm -hmm. that you need to be consistent with. Yes. And of course, there has to be vegetable. There has to be, there has to be other forms of, um, of you know, uh, food nutritious uh, mm. nutrition that will enhance quality care for the individual. Okay. But you see, our system is such that we are, you know, we, we are stuck to certain food items. But you can also look at, um, you know, uh, what I am. You know, you can look at, um, you know, uh, plantain, okay. the unripe yeah. one, you know. So there are varieties that we can, can you know, eat. look at. Okay. But we, we always say it's not that you stop eating everything you have known. Mm. That's counterproductive. Well, but this time around, you need to reduce, reduce the quantity, quantity of each and each. make sure that you don't overload yourself with a specific food item. Okay. Well, our time is up on the U45 morning show for today. Uh, Dr. Peter Jomo, we thank you for coming. He's